So for the panel, we're going to have our second keynote speaker, Dr. Dirk Bergman, join us. Uh, Dirk is here. There you go. Okay, very good. Uh, I'm going to quickly do an introduction for uh, for Dirk, but we're going to do the full introduction later um, at the second keynote slot that you can find in the schedule. So Dr. Dirk Bergman is a professor of economics at Yale University. Uh, he also has a secondary appointment in computer science in the School of Engineering um, and in the finance in the School of uh, Management at Yale University. Uh, Dr. Uh, Bergman is known to many of us uh, through his foundational work in game theory, contract theory, and market and mechanism design. And I'm especially inspired by a lot of the work that he's done on data economies and data markets, which is sort of uh, the kind of the flip, flip side of what uh, uh, Dr. Gray had discussed in her keynote just now. Uh, uh, Dr. Bergman has held many leadership positions that will mention within economics, both within uh, Yale and also within the broader field, including Econometrica, American Economic Review, and many others that we'll mention uh, later today. But, um, but for now, we'll stop here and, uh, and say that we're very grateful to have you here and we're very grateful to, uh, to start this panel with you. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Reddit, and thank you, Mary, for a wonderful talk. <clears throat> Very good. So let's jump right into it. So um, there's there's a lot really that your your talk um, uh, got me thinking about, Mary, and a lot that your work has inspired me, um, uh, Dirk. Uh, one thing that comes to mind is I think there's now this acknowledgement that um, it, there's a very deep need to include uh, those that who are marginalized themselves and also those who are kind of working on the front lines, right? So you mentioned community health workers, social workers come to mind, public defenders, right? So there's a lot of um, individuals and communities that are uh, doing a lot of frontline work. And um, I completely agree with you, Mary, that um, we're not necessarily systematizing how we include them in decision making for those of us who are on the sort of algorithmic side of things um, and often actually trying to uh, connect with these communities is um, is not a clear path, right? And so you really, this is something that you're just going to have to do uh, kind of on your own. And I see that as a very deep problem because I agree with you that uh, that we need to include those voices, but when we do, it tends to be very ad hoc. And so from both your perspectives, Mary, having done this sort of for quite quite a while, and, and Dirk, I know your work has also been very inspired by all different types of stakeholders, but you know, uh, in the kind of intellectual space, you're closer to the computer science economic side like I am. How do you uh, see ways that we can try to systematize this and make it not one off? Um, what are the challenges that you see and what opportunities do you do you see? Maybe I could kick it off because I would really love to hear both of you um, hear what you think might be constraints on this. But I, I feel like what I'm seeing is um, that because there is such a palpable lack of diversity in uh, computer science and engineering and all of the, the kind of cognate fields, it, the first order of business is, is, um, is having different perspectives. And particularly when we're talking about systemic oppression, that means who's, who is missing, who's been disadvantaged, like the first order of business is yes, they should be in, in the conversation. My concern is that I think we're starting, um, and, and this goes to your point, Reddit, that we're not being systematic and thinking there has to be rigor to what that diversity and inclusion looks like. And it's tokenizing. It's just flat out tokenizing to think now I've got a scholar of color, so I'm set. Because there's no way in which any um, scholar, unless they're trained in that domain of expertise, would possibly have more to offer than anyone else. They're offering something different, which is the most important part. Like you have to have a range of people um, in a room able to have a conversation to get out of one's own mindset. But that I, I think that critical piece that I've been looking for is what is the role of the domain expert? And the challenges to me are making systemically the kinds of um, multifaceted multidisciplinary teams means it would make no sense to go it alone. It should never seem like, gosh, this is hard. I need to go find a community group. The first order of business should be, who's the domain expert who understands these community groups and this problem so that I would be able to have the expertise in communicating with those groups so that we're not taking on the task of, I'm going to become an expert in all things um, 
but rather I'm looking for the experts I'm missing to have that kind of humility and conceit that no one person, or there's a few exceptions, um, you might be one of them, who can spend that much time learning the domain that they're trying to address. I actually think it's quite risky to, to, to do that. I think I'd rather, um, and I think the biggest barrier is actually the structure of the university. Dirk, can you comment on that? I would love your thoughts on this structural issue within universities and departments like ours. Uh, <laughs> yes. um, so there's a sense in which I, I agree, and I actually I'm struck by, uh, by Mary's comment in the sense that, um, you know, in law schools, um, we have um, a quite a big movement of uh, public interest law, that is, we have both courses as well as funds available that trains lawyers to work for the public interest. Um, in schools of management, we have um, entire groups working on nonprofits. Um, you know, there are schools of public policies that clearly are meant to gather economists, political scientists, data scientists to, uh, to work for public policy. Um, I think there's sort of a surprising lack or, you know, maybe it is because computer science is a relatively young, data science is a relatively young experience. There's a surprising lack, I would say, at the level of the universities to build out expertise uh, in that area, um, you know, of uh, social computation. Um, I think there's a big wave of open source software that was incredibly successful, you know, still driving a lot of innovation, uh, but somehow it hasn't uh, found its way yet to uh, social organizations. I'm struck by the lack of, you know, use in some sense or availability of tools at the local community level, you know, even uh, if you think about local communities literally as towns and cities, um, they are in some sense completely underpowered and overwhelmed uh, in terms of deploying uh, data. And that's even more true than of, you know, underprivileged communities where uh, just securing minimal resources to, to build up a small system, to build up a small system of data gathering is, is absent. And, you know, that's maybe particularly true in the US. So in Europe, in fact, surprisingly, maybe the smaller Eastern European states. So Estonia, Lithuania have a very different approach of making access to data, to computing devices for citizens available and, 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 and having the public sort of um, allowing digital transparency and, and access. Um, and I think there's a big gap both in the education, uh, and in the structure, certainly at the universities that would allow, you know, basically an educational pipeline that would move students in this direction, equip them with the tools, and also, you know, help community organizers, help um, community workers to likewise benefit from uh, education in, you know, do two or three steps um, in basic computing, basic data sciences. So. Um, language, for example, is a, so let me stop with this last point. So language is often a requirement in colleges. You know, I would think nowadays we should probably think of computing, you know, coding as sort of a basic language requirement that really empowers a lot of people to do things. Um, and we are nowhere near uh, to sort of offer that to the community at the, at the, at the scale level. Um, can, may I pick up one thing right before we move on about absolutely because I'm seeing a few people in the chat talk about public interest technology and this is not a well formed thought so this is what I love about a small conference <laughs> is that we can we can kind of think out loud together. I think one of the biggest challenges for a move in public interest um, technology as a you know as as it imagines it's like public interest law is that public interest law is dealing with, um, with, with legal structures governance that is in most cases by definition public already. 
And most laws are, are drafted in the interest of um, publics, even if it's pub, you know, private citizens, it's, it, has an, it has an imaginary of the public. Computer science and engineering, um, software development particularly, it, the hardest thing is grappling with the fact that it's born out of a commercial interest more, or a defense interest. Mm. But at the end of the day, um, the markets today yeah. around computing um, are saturated in market logic. It's how do I build something somebody will buy? And then maybe it'll be useful to the public as a, a you know, as a charitable good. I, I believe that one of the challenges for um, building technologies for social needs is that we have yet to fully um, figure out a way to see at least not um, a secondary order of commercial interest and public interest, but rather see that the, and I hope the pandemic taught all of this, that um, public interest is best served by taking care of the public and economies follow from a, from a, um, a healthy public. A mm -hmm. Kind of, I mean, this could be the lesson we take away from COVID that in fact, we built systems and relied on proprietary commercial software to manage the pandemic. And it failed miserably, miserably, Absolutely. because it was built for a different kind of case management, a commercial health interest rather than um, care as something um, that is a fundamental need and arguably a human right. So I think one of our biggest challenges is that the market logic that structures and in sense, innovation is a, um, I would argue, a hindrance to software development right now because we don't have a way of building software without um, starting with that um, incentive to scale, which is really a market logic. I mean, you want more people to buy it faster is, is one way to think about it. But I'm, I'm maybe throwing that out because I know Dirk's on uh, and all That's of you can... Push Let's back. dig deeper. Let's dig deeper. I would love to discuss this idea of uh, control, actually. Um, so, Mary, you mentioned this in the context of data collection and, and, and data sharing, who gets to uh, collect the data and guide the process of collecting data. And then once it has been collected, who owns and controls that data? This is something that I know both of you have worked on uh, it kind of from different angles, but I think actually pretty complementary angles. And so I would love to get your perspectives using health and maybe even COVID-19 as an example, what have we learned about what the challenges are here in terms of, um, in terms of this issue of power and control in terms of you know, what kind of data we collect, how we collect it, uh, what you mentioned, uh, Mary, about <clears throat> you know, when you collect data, you're reproducing categories, right? So how do you, you know, uh, make sure that the data collection process is evolving as we're kind of better understanding and, uh, and trying to um, uh, sort of uh, do sort do right by you know all members of society, right? So how do you think about this process of control and data? What are the biggest challenges uh, uh, here, and uh, what opportunities do you see to move things forward? So maybe I can start with, with Mary's comment. Um, Clearly, you know, a lot of software development is driven by uh, by private companies who uh, have sort of immediate goals in terms of scaling. Um, but I think, you know, we can think about um, what is missing in sense or what makes software look uh, so different in the moment uh, from other parts of the economy where we actually have established governance uh, by, by the public that allows us to turn, you know, private interest into something that is also of public interest. So, uh, you know, financial markets um, have and, and, and it is widely agreed, have to have a public governance structure. There has to be transparency. There have to be uh, public records uh, so that uh, there is a uniform price, that there is equal access and opportunity to try to trade on financial markets. So uh, all of these principles, you know, they're always fought over and contested and need to be sort of constantly secured and re-secured. 
uh, but but I think in the public we are clear that they're critical for a well functioning and a, a socially efficient financial market. So I think what is striking is that. Uh, in data markets so far, we have basically no federal governance. And, and I think the discussion that we're having now is um, you know, very timely because uh, you have seen um, now, you know, even uh, before the new uh, government coming in, an interest from both from Republican and Democratic side to find sort of maybe for different motives, maybe for different interests, but nonetheless, there's an interest to say, uh, we need to think about what should be the governance uh, sort of first step california has made a step in terms of a data privacy act uh, new york has a proposal that is being discussed but at the federal level there's nothing yet and so i think when you mentioned uh, in one of your last slides technology and relationships um then then that's true but i think we we also need to establish sort of a, a governance and and I guess part of the the failures that we're experiencing and the lack of establishing, uh, you know, social um, social resources for computing is that we don't have a, a governance structure. And I think we are about to see uh, that being established, uh, perhaps too slow, but it's it's not that we are not you know completely um guilt free as scientists so economists certainly haven't worked hard enough to sort of update their way of thinking about regulation to to data uh, and to information that is quite different from you know from physical objects and um there is a way in which you know given their significance and importance computer scientists are also rather mute or silent in, in the public discourse at large right so there are very few uh, i mean i i think that right so that's um that's the case and so i think we we have to push a little bit harder within our respective professions as well to to contribute uh, to the public discourse i could not agree more like i think in many ways can we you know, use our own practices as opportunities for reflection on what we would like to see in terms of how we work with people's data. And I, it's interesting because I think um, I, I the lack of governance, the, com the complete utter absence of regulation is, um, it is noteworthy. Like what other industry is allowed to innovate at this pace without accountability to society. I mean, I think of governance as fundamentally a way of assuring or at least putting in place a system for calling out accountability and responsibility. Yeah, and have so, transparency and guardrails. That's what exactly. 100%. And, and I think the toughest thing, and actually the thing that you know leaves me most optimistic if I look around this Zoom room is like, okay, we're early days and we know that that governance is critical for being able to have the systems of accountability um, that are going to, to, to really um, be of most use to society, that we, we need that governance function. I think the, the argument I would make now based on the research we've been doing around Project Resolve is that so often in governance, we leave out community actors and, and they've been so effectively marginalized. And actually the pandemic was just a, um, you know, a box seat to the dismissal of the subject matter expertise of community groups. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, in the state of North Carolina, I'll, and as this was common in most states, states felt like we need to figure out contact tracing. How do we do that? Mm -hmm. it, it literally was so common to work with what was procured software and who was the private company already in place who could provide um, contact tracing, even though in most cases that meant the, you know, the a person who might have been recruited to do contact tracing by phone had none of the language skills necessary to be calling anybody, like some basic things were missing, mostly because they started from what's already an existing commercial contract the state has with a private company to do this healthcare work. And it took such utter failure and um, gaps in vaccine distribution for cities to finally say, who are the community groups who actually work with these individuals who need vaccines? Let's just 
work with them directly. And it was, it was done not with this uh, recognition that these are the best people for gathering data are the folks who actually have the clearest sense of how would you find somebody who's housing insecure when they need their second dose of a vaccine, that there are community-based groups who are really well positioned for that. But importantly, that is necessary, not sufficient. The, the, the right now, community-based organizations become really the weakest link to securing data they collect. They know the data they collect, they don't have the technologies and the support systems to manage the data they collect. So what do they do? They literally don't keep it. They become pass-throughs. They, they will enter information into state le legacy systems in most cases, and they will not keep the data because they know that it's going to be a liability for them and for their clients if they have names of people and particularly for undocumented, for community-based organizations that work with undocumented workers, they, they, they literally lose the data, the value of the data they could be collecting because there is no effective mechanism for them to manage it. That, that is actually something we could technically solve for if we wanted to empower those community-based organizations to be the data trust. That's why I'm so excited about the other speakers for the conference. It's like being able to position community-based organizations to be the, the, the trust, trusted stewards is, is of value to all of us. And it, it is, can, it is, yielding and positioning them to be those power brokers that um, has so much potential. And it's also clear there's, that is the, the place that those in power do not want to go because it, it's, um, it's unnerving to imagine you have to ask for something you otherwise have been able to just take. I love that comment, Mary. So we will need to wrap up soon. So I just want to ask one quick question and get uh, get your thoughts, both in terms of increasing governance and accountability and what you mentioned, Mary, just now around what are the things that we can build and, uh, and do uh, in order to sort of uh, increase the um, sort of control that these um, frontline workers and community organizers and community members have um, as members of um, of this sort of ecosystem, right? Um, so I wanted to ask, you know, a lot of the conference attendees here are, um, majority of them are kind of junior researchers, right? Um, in computer science and economics operations research, uh, sociology, po public policy, that kind of space. Um, and we also have attendees um, who are uh, practitioners in various spaces, uh, but especially, you know, focused on sort of the more junior members of this conference, what are the things that um, we could be working on both in our research and also advocacy in order to um, uh, kind of shift around the who controls uh, these these data sets, right, and who controls sort of the process by which they're collected, um, and increasing accountability and governance. So both the research aspect of it and the advocacy aspect. What are the the advice that you'd be willing to share for our conference attendees? Well, I, the first thing I want to say is um, it should be hard to, to work with groups that you've never worked with before. So I think one of the most important things for all of us to take away, if you're an emerging scholar earlier in your career, is um, to, to both take heart that um, you're at the, you're doing something quite different than what your established scholars are doing and have been um, what, uh, I, I don't have a nice way to put this, <laughs> that basically, uh, you know, established scholars are allowed to divorce themselves from the, um, the kinds of social problems that are now in front of us all. And I would say, you know, my advice to emerging scholars who are at the intersections of these, of these, um, fields of inquiry that want to understand how would you build systems uh, that both incent everybody to be thinking about multiple stakeholders and constantly calculating the risks and benefits to these different stakeholders, that the, the way to shore up your, your tactics for this are to recruit colleagues who have complementary domain expertise 
So rather than feeling like you have to be the, you know, the lone um, soldier here and fighting this fight, the most important thing, and, and ready, it can tell you this, like that means sitting down before you have a problem to solve and thinking, okay, we want to understand the shape of problems. So I, I actually think it's really critical for emerging scholars to be thinking, you've got this very particular domain expertise. It is not about um, stepping aside and seeing how do I have actors who are fighting every single day trying to get work done? Um, how do I hand them the keys? That's, that's, that's not a, a genuine open-handed gesture. It's how do you wedge your body as a domain expert and keep the door open for subject matter experts who are based in community organizing, who are fighting very specific problems. How do you keep the door open for them to be able to bring in their expertise and help you support what they're doing to identify what is their agenda? What is it that they see as a problem to solve rather than trying to imagine what is the best problem for for you to solve. That actually takes a ton of practice, a ton of practice. And the last thing I'll say is like volunteer. Don't do anything before you've volunteered for an organization that has a problem you would like to solve. Because until you've had enough exposure to what that problem looks like, it'll be impossible to have a, um, an ongoing conversation to be able to address it. Thank you so much, Mary. Dirk, any, any final I, thoughts? I guess um, Mary made it sound um, a little bit tough. And certainly, you know, um, you shouldn't, I mean, it, it shouldn't be easy and, and you shouldn't expect it to be easy. But on the other hand, I think um, I would also encourage you, especially since we have such an international audience, right? So um, abroad, and, and meaning that widely, things are often a little bit more fluid. Um, smaller groups are often a little bit more perceptive uh, to establishing a new database, solving new problems. So the immediate impact that your research can have uh, can be much higher. You can uh, address a problem that all of your senior colleagues uh, haven't thought about it. And it, it's not merely an extension, but it's really uh, making a step forward. And um, there's, of course, lots to be also gained in terms of knowledge from uh, from the interdisciplinary act. So certainly don't go it alone, but I think, you know, as a citizen um, sort of uh, of your society, of your community, um, even before you think about our organization, you are aware of issues. Uh, COVID certainly showed it that, you know, the communities, I mean, there was very few innovation in some sense, the community level, so there were lots of constraints on the community level to actually address contract tracing or anything of that sort. And most local, I mean, local at the state level efforts sort of didn't go very far and, and, and sort of there's clearly a big breakdown there. So, so I think, you know, in, in economics, for example, we made huge progress in, in school choice, school matching, and that often started very small and very modest and, you know, looking at one small city that had a little bit of an odd procedure and uh, that we can improve. So, so I think uh, there's receptions from the institutions, from the community. So with little courage, I think the return can also be quite sufficient. So I want to be a little bit more encouraging perhaps. Yeah. I'm so glad you said that, Dirk, <laughs> because it's true. Like this is going to have, we're just at the beginning of having a profound, a profound impact. And it's, it's very exciting because we can do quite a bit if we will just shift our focus a little. Mm -hmm. Thank you both so incredibly much. I loved your talk, Mary, and loved your comments. And Dirk, I loved your comments, and I'm 